there's no TV? Um, no, because it's... Well, he's... Is he not recording, but not... He is recording. There won't be no sound, right. So, we can start. I don't... What are you looking for? My agenda. Right there. That's it? Oh. Oh. Half a ton of papers. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to this January 11, 2016 Selectman's meeting. First, we will start with public comment. Anyone wishing public comment? Seeing none, we'll move back here to the uh, selectmen for uh, public hearing. Yeah, the public hearing. Number one, for the purpose our public hearing pursuant to RSA 33-8-A. For the purpose of complying with the provisions of RSA 33-8-A to take testimony from those who wish to be heard concerning the possible issuance of a serial bond in the sum of $2 million for the following. Improvements to wastewater treatment plant to perform various projects that will include the following. The replacement of the septage intake works in combination with the washdown facility, the purpose and installation of a generator to maintain secondary treatment during powder outages, improvements to recycled wastewater yard piping, life utility improvements to the sewer plant value pit and a hazardous entry area. Uh, opening the public hearing at what time? At 7.05. 7.05. Anyone wishing to speak? Seeing none, I will bring it to the board. Mr. Waddell? Uh, we had a good presentation on this, I believe. I'm, I'm pretty well satisfied with Mr. what's going Ryan. on. This. We, yeah, as Jim said, we did have a pretty good presentation on this. Uh, we have a well-qualified staff down there. Uh, there's a lot of years of experience down there, probably more than anywhere in the, in the seacoast. So uh, I, I take what they want to do as what we need to do. So I'm going to support it. Thank you. Mrs. Wolseley. Yes. Um, I want to ask uh, Director Jacobs, you got to have a lot of slides, Chris, at the deliberative session so that the public can actually see kind of step by step, because I, I know you have some. We can expand on the, um, the uh, PowerPoint presentation we have, certainly. Um, I think that would be very helpful to people who don't think about this every day. Right. It's kind of, you know, some things like Replacing valves in the valve pit are probably pretty straightforward. The um, one component of the work uh, is below ground, the, where we right. re repiping in the yard. Right. Uh, the sludge pit, yeah, you, we're probably just better off with some photos. I don't think anyone really wants to go to the sludge pit, um, <laughs> but yeah, we can we can certainly beef that so up. So people have an idea where on the premises this sure. is located and, and the approximate size, etc. Yeah. I think that would be helpful to people yeah. who really aren't conversant with it. Yes. Thank uh, you. Have no problem with that. No questions, sir. So you just, need a motion to uh, affirm the warrant. After we close yes, the public hearing? Close. So at, the public hearing is closed. At what time? At 7.08. 7 Make a motion that we... Uh, we accept the Warren article. Is that what you want? Yes. For the, the bond article. The bond article. And is there as, a second? As, as presented. I'll second it. All those in favor, unanimous. You might want to correct those times because that clock's not right. You opened it at 7.02 and you closed well, it at 7.05. We well, well, then when you open another one, it's going to... Whose watch are we using? <laughs> I got that right here. Oh, okay. So it's, it's the right time. So 7.02 it opened in 7.05. Five, you closed it. Okay. Okay. It's important Public for the minutes. hearing pursuant to RSA 31 colon 95 dash B. Roman 3. Roman 3. A. A. 
For the purpose of complying with provisions of RSA 3195 <clears throat> for the following, to apply for, accept, and expand unanticipated monies in the amount of $10,000 or more from the following in 2016, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, National Oceanic Atmosphere. Atmosphere Administration, NOAA, U.S. Department of Transportation, U.S. Department of Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, U.S. Department of Justice, and the Office of Justice Programs, U.S. Department of Homeland Security Grants, DHS, Federal Emergency Management Agency Grants, FEMA, FEMA Hazard Mitigation Grant, Flood Mitigation Assistance Grant, New Hampshire Homeland Security Program, New Hampshire Department of Safety Grants, First Responder Grant, Public Safety Communications, Interoperability Operability Grants, Law Enforcement, Terrorism Prevention Program, Homeland Security Exercise and, evalu and Evaluation Grants, Radiological Radiological, radiological radiological emergency response grants emergency management grants staffing for adequate fire and emergency response grants fire prevention and safety grants new hampshire department of justice grants new hampshire department of transportation new hampshire dot new hampshire highway safety agency new hampshire housing finance authority new hampshire department of Environmental Services, New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources, New Hampshire Cultural Resources, New Hampshire Community Finance Authority, New Hampshire Office of Energy and Planning, New Hampshire Historical Society, New Hampshire Fish and Game, New Hampshire Division of Historic Resources Grant Program, New Hampshire Preservation Allowance, New Hampshire Department of Resources and Economic Development, Northeast Regional Ocean Council, the LCHIP Grant Program, Rockingham Planning Commission, Trust for Public Land, Coastal Hazards and Climate Change, Coastal Resiliency Grants, Aquatic Resource Mitigation, Repetitive Flood Claim, Severe Repetitive Loss, Pre-Disaster Mitigation Grant, Assistance Program for New Hampshire Coastal Zone Communities, Piscataqua Regional Estuary Partnership Grant, Field Pond, Foundation. That's a mouthful. Yeah, really. Opening the public hearing at 706. 706. 707, I'm sorry. Okay. And would anyone like to speak? Seeing none, we'll move it. Oh, you're going to speak? Excuse me, yes, I That was quite a long list. <laughs> it begs the question what are the strings attached with this money? I know that perhaps you won't know it until you actually apply for the grants. But I hope that you will give uh, consideration to the strings, which are sometimes problematic. So that's all I have to say. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none, we'll move back to the board. Maybe, maybe you should just, uh, exp we're not getting $10,000 from each, you know, to the public, that each one of those is not giving us that money. No. So that people aren't confused, you know, when you go through that whole list. It's the, the opportunity, the reason it's the opportunity to, apply. to get it. To apply, the opportunity to apply, to make sure people know that and realize that. Closing the hearing at what time, Jim? Uh, well, yeah, 7, 7.09? 7.09. Okay. And then moving back to the board. I'm all set. Any other comments? Seeing I'll, none. I'll so move that we uh, authorize the pursuance of such grants during the year. And is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor, unanimous. Great. Yay. <laughs> Next, we have announcements in community calendar. Mr. Bridal. I am all set. Thank you. Oh, I have one. Um, I noticed the kids are in, kids, adults, and whatever are using Bachelor's Pond to skate on, and it's great to see the, the people out there. But I've also noticed that while they're out there, they're grabbing trash cans and boxes and stuff and putting them out on the ice to use as goals or whatever. Yeah. And I would just ask that if they put them out there, kindly take them off the ice when uh, when they do, 
problem is they've got to freeze in and they ruin the ice for everybody else. It happened uh, on uh, Thursday. Uh, Thursday. Uh, Friday, there was some kids skating out there, and uh, I stopped by and I asked them if they take the stuff off, and they said, oh, yeah, sure. And good thing they did because when we had all the rain, it, it ruined the ice, and uh, that stuff would have sank all down through it. So if you're going to skate there, it's great to see the people using it. Just take a little care of it. That's all. Thank you. That's a good thought. This is Wolseley. <clears throat> yes. Um, I believe it was starting on Wednesday afternoon that I started getting calls from the public over the lack of sound and the lack of the uh, TV on Channel 22. Uh, I was never notified. I don't think it takes very long to pick up a telephone. I think we should know when something like that happens. I've been complaining about the quality of the sound on Channel 22 for a quite a while. Uh, we are now uh, in a difficult position because we have some serious meetings coming up this week uh, related to the annual budgeting. And uh, I know uh, Mr. Um, Welch assured me that the meetings will be uh, saved, but nevertheless, the public will not have an opportunity to view them in a timely fashion. Um, first of all, if equipment is starting to show wear like that, we ought to be more proactive. And next, if we need a stand-up uh, unit, which Mr. Welch says will cost about 17000 uh, given the inconvenience that this is causing to the public, uh, I think that we ought to discuss that probably in the next meeting or two. I really think this is an unacceptable situation to be in regarding the cable. Mr. Bean. I have nothing, sir. Mr. Waddell. And I don't have anything. Next is the consent agenda. I will so move, Mr. Chairman. Do you want the uh, gender edit? It's veterans tax requalifications. And a cemetery deed. Cemetery deed. And this one cemetery deed. Huh? And that's you know stipulated in the agenda. I'll make a motion we pass the consent agenda. I, I so move. Second. You, seconding. All okay. those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. So number two, we have the veterans tax. Oh, no, that's all said. That includes the, that one. Yeah. Yeah. All those. Okay. Um, <laughs> Diana, would you stop? Yes. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to start. Okay. Yeah. Mrs. Wolseley, please keep your comments to yourself. Yes. Yeah. Next, we have Diana Martin, Recreation and Parks. Good evening. Good evening, Diana. I have um, a short list for you today of all the things that we've been doing in Parks and Rec. Um, in Parks Maintenance, um, the Parks employees did a great job this year keeping up with the playground inspections, and they're still doing those weekly, um, preparing the fields for play and all of that. They also put up the Christmas decorations for us, and um, myself and Bob took down the tree and Santa today. We still have to do the Christmas lights. But other than that, that's all taken care of. And the trash is being picked up around the parks and in the tuck building for the ongoing programs that we have there. And they picked up all the trash barrels in the different parks and in the parking lots for the season. In the parking lots, Victor DeMarco and the parking lot crews worked hard again this past year and are gearing up for a March start this, this 2016. In the lots last year, we made $585,376.86. I don't know how that 86 cents got in there, but we had a great year in the parking lots this year. For recreation programs, we're gearing up for the spring and summer sports and are having our first meeting with softball leagues in the near future. We had one of our best camp seasons ever last year, and we're starting the preparations for camp again this year. The K-2 sports program is underway, and we are now in the third phase of a five-phase program. We had our senior citizen club lunch, holiday luncheon, as well as a senior's Christmas turkey dinner. Both were very well attended and enjoyed. Art with Mrs. A has just finished for the season, and now we've got a new program starting up um, January 19th. We had a great New York City day trip on November 21st, as well as the Portland Symphony uh, Magic of Christmas on December 12th and a Freeport shopping trip on November 18th. 
We've set up trips to Dancing in the Streets for March 30th and Disney on Ice, 100 Years of Magic on February 21st. Um, both of those are in Boston. We also have scheduled a number of trips to the North Shore Music Hall for the summer, including Funny Girl, Mary Poppins, Singing in the Rain, Spam a Lot, West Side Story, and A Christmas Carol. Men's basketball is starting and will continue through the school year. We have a number of ongoing programs for the seniors running right now um, that we're taking registrations for, which include the bingo. We have Bone Builders, which is actually waitlisted. We have Bridge, Hampton Walkers, and we have a couple yoga classes. We have scheduled the Hampton Rec Ski and Ride program. However, we have canceled the first two weeks of the program due to the weather. Not much snow going on. The local league, which is our high school rec hoop league, is up and running this year, and we have six teams, which is the most that we've ever had, which is great. Even when this it used to be a travel league, and now it's just in-house, so it's doing really well with that. We implemented our holiday events, which included the tree lighting and the Christmas parade with Experience Hampton, and then on December 14th and 15th, the tour of lights. And so we're just moving on, preparing for all of our stuff. We do have a couple more that I forgot to put on the sheet. We have a we have set up a parkour, an intro to parkour, which students train to develop strength, speed, endurance, precision, spatial awareness, dynamicism, and cre creativity in order to be as fluid, functional, and liberated as possible in physical movement and to overcome physical obstacles. And we've scheduled that for our uh, February vacation activities, and that's $150 for kids ages 6 through 12. And um, let's get moving yoga is starting up again on Wednesdays. And then we also have the Connected Elephant, which is uh, connected to the me, teaches girls how to play att pay attention from the inside out, helps regulate emotions in a work-filled and sensory overload, pressure sports in school. Classes include instruction, meditation, and activity, ongoing tools for regulation, positive self-awareness, and stress reduction. And that's starting in January as well. And that's for girls grades three through five. We also have one trip that um, Renee just set up. It's also to Boston. It's for the Monster Energy Supercross. Supercross is an indoor bike racing and a newer version of motocross, the sport's original form. The track takes all the exciting obstacles of outdoor riding, jumps, turns, and bumps, amplifies them, and puts them in an easy view of spectators. So that trip's going to be April 23rd of 2016. And that's at Gillette Stadium, and that's $120 per person. And that is all for right now. Questions, Mr. Wardell? Yeah, um, wow. Diana, you do a great job. You have a lot of activity going on for the kids and stuff, and a lot of activities. The, uh, the holiday, the tree lighting in, in the, you know, that you guys participated in in the, in the uh, Christmas parade were great for the town. Great. Yeah, it was great weather this year. It was too. great weather, and there were a lot of people there at the uh, tree lighting. I think it was well attended. It was really good. Um, the park course, what was that again? Honestly, I think I'm too old to know what this really is. But, um, well, if I could find it. Parkour, intro to parkour. Students trained to develop strength, speed, endurance, precision, spatial awareness, dynamicism, and creativity in order to be as fluid, functional, and liberated as possible in physical <laughs> movement and to overcome physical obstacles. I think it's sort of a... And where is that going to take place? That's going to be at the Hampton Academy Lower Gym for ages 6 through 12. I think it's sort of a obstacle course-ish, but it's also... <laughs> Yoga, it like I think it takes that all together. There's some moving and bending and yeah. stretching. And Sounds really good. Yeah. I mean, you do a great job. And the, uh, the the parking lots were great this year. Parking lots were stupendous this year. They were up this year. Mm -hmm. And you're going to start early again next year. And yeah, I can't believe we're starting in March this year, which is the earliest ever, I think. Super. Thank you. Mr. Bridle. Oh, it was an excellent report. As always, uh, Parks and Rec does do an excellent job. I was, I was amazed at the amount of people at the tree lighting. I know. Uh, that was probably what I've done it now for a number of years, and that's probably the best community support I've seen in a long time. Had to do with the weather. It was a nice night out, but yeah. it, was, uh, it was still. And, and I, I see that at every every one of your events. I see they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and, and that goes to uh, a great staff. And, Thank you and uh, great people that you have working for it and doing it, so thank you. Yeah, I think we have a lot of uh, 
a lot of people are doing some of our things traditionally now. It's like a tradition to go to these things now. So that's really great, too. Mrs. Wolseley. Lights all set for softball this year? Yep. Very nice. Yep. Excellent. It's good to be on this end of the project. Yeah. Mr. Bean. Great job as usual. Nothing, sir. Thank you. We really appreciate it that you uh, do such a great job. We hear a lot about people taking co um, part in your events, and it's always positive. Thank you. Have a nice evening. All right. Thank you. You too. Next, we have Christy, finance director. Oh, it's 25th, so it's now. Oh, it's in the wrong night? It's, it should be the 25th. Oh, okay. okay. Next, we have trustees of the trust fund. Please join us at the table. Good evening. Um, we asked for this appointment as a result of last uh, watching last week's uh, meeting of the Board of Select. We had previously sent you a response to the inquiries that were have been sent to us by the Board of Select regarding Mackinson and Company, regarding issues uh, associated with uh, the letter from the Attorney General's office and I was aghast when the response was about the methodology we used in responding rather than the content of what we responded. And so we received a letter from Mr. Welch earlier this week, last week, and I've responded to it and I have that to hand out to you at the conclusion of our presentation. But at this point, I would like to uh, let John Sovich uh, talk to you a little bit about the letter that we put together. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm John Sovich, one of the trustees. Um, if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I think we'll get where we're going to go pretty quickly. I left town, my wife and I left town on the 23rd of November, and we returned uh, last Tuesday. Uh, we have kids down south, we headed south, uh, we headed to uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina, where someone from Boston built a uh, New England village, kind of ironic that we went to North Carolina, a New England <laughs> village, when we live in New England, but that's what happened. So anyway, um, Mr. Donovan's letter caught up with me on Thanksgiving Day when I was at my son's uh, in Virginia. Um, when something like that comes in, I usually use a ready, aim, fire type of position. I look at it, try to read it, see if there's a problem, determine if there's a problem, and determine what must be done if there is a problem. I read that letter. I determined there were no time-sensitive concerns. We had already met with David Mays on the 19th of October. We had reviewed our investments. We had view, reviewed and voted on our relationship with Mackinson. There were no solvency issues. The funds were not impacted and they were safe. I didn't know anything about the promotional material or who had seen it or if we were affected. That's one of the areas I didn't know for sure. Two of us uh, were not even trustees at that time. Myself and John Troiano were not even on the board. So. <clears throat> even if the other trustees had seen the material, it didn't require immediate attention. It could become a legal matter, and that could take a long period of time to solve. So I viewed it, I, I looked at it, and since there was no suspense, I determined the action could probably wait until I get back in January. I also viewed the letter as non-directive by its use of adverbs and modifying verbs such as should look, may wish to, perhaps seek, and might consult. 
to me uh, and have uh, some a little background in contracts, those are non-directive in their nature. So uh, since it was that, I determined I didn't contact anybody. I figured we would wait until we got back and had our meeting in, in January. From there, we drove uh, from Virginia to the New England Village in North Carolina. Um, I received the uh, your letter, the Board of Selectmen's letter, somewhere. It was published on the 14th, and I probably got it about the 17th or 18th of uh, December. I looked at the same type of things that I looked at in uh, Donovan's letter. This letter took a non-directive letter from the Charitable Trust Unit and tried to make it mandatory. It implied that we had taken no actions. It made false assumptions. It asserted the Boston's authority where none, ex uh, the uh, Selectman's authority where none existed. And quite frankly, it ticked me off. So uh, I'll just go over a few things, and then we'll get on to where we're going to go. I don't know who wrote it, but the first thing I noticed is uh, on, on the second line, the selectmen shall be responsible to ensure the safeguarding. Someone uh, left off the internal control procedures, which is uh, quite common. Next one, uh, that it was a fact-intensive and we needed an inquiry. Again, there were some, some letters left out without any ellipsis. I had also told us to date you had not sought to consult with town council. Well, that's probably because on the... Oh, I have an email from the town council that said, Norm, the following email from you from me to you, from November 5th, copying the trustees, made it clear that I do not represent the trustees in the SEC, SEC issue, as I already represent the Board of Selectmen. Accordingly, your emails to me are not privileged and are the equivalent of communicating with the Board. It further went on and say, in light of my representing the Selectmen, I cannot advise you how to interpret the Board's letter to the trustees dated December 14, 2015. Although I believe the letter is clear and straightforward, if you need clarification, I would suggest you write to the Board of Selectmen. Okay. The letter also states, uh, we should look at your returns and perhaps seek a meeting with Mr. Mays. Uh, that occurred on the 19th of October in open session, uh, a month before we even got the letter from Mr. Donovan. solvency issue. I looked at all our investments. I downloaded the investments that we had from the website, went to Morningstar um, by way of uh, the library here, and looked at every rating on every investment that we had. There were no proprietary investments to Mackinson. Solvency wasn't an issue. The board should have known it wasn't an issue. You have uh, a finance director who, to whom we have sent all the reports since July. We have sent every prospectus for every fund we own. It would be very easy to look at that and say, there is no solvency issue. They don't have proprietary funds. down towards the bottom on page two to commence the action items as set forth. Um, even Director Donovan by phone on the December 4th said his letter only recommends the trustees reevaluate their relationship with Mackinson. It's not an order. I spoke today with uh, Terry Knowles at the same division who told me that they don't have the authority to direct, they were merely suggestions. She had written the draft with Director Donovan. So that was uh, her advice to me today. Um, and then, you know, before we, we get to the meat of why we're really here, no letter would be complete without bashing Warren Mackinson, and that letter certainly does. Um, I've known Warren for over 30 years. 
He's a graduate of the Naval Academy. He's a duty, honor, country type of guy. The AG's ruling back in 2010 was that he had a conflict of interest because it could be used to his, his company's promotional material. It wasn't because he did anything wrong. It was because he might have the ability to use it in his company's material. The latest thing with the SEC, Warren probably made a mistake. I, I don't know. I assume it was. The SEC found that there was some problem with his promotional material. He didn't go out and start a Ponzi scheme. He didn't uh, take widows and orphans money. He made a mistake. And, and that's it. He paid dearly for the mistake, and he continues to. But I think rather than bashing Warren Mackinson, I saw the latest numbers today. Uh, over the last five years, under, um, with his company, these trustees uh, have put $3.2 million back into the taxpayers. Finally, we get to the letter of uh, what we had last week. I said we got back on Tuesday. Um, I saw where the selectmen met on the 4th, and I got a Dear Selectman email in the afternoon that came from Mr. Welsh's office looking for emails and uh, the right to know law. I immediately uh, got onto the Hampton Union website to see what was going on and found out that in the evening before, there were certain uh, things said. Somebody said we violated the right to know law. They either had a meeting or they were doing it behind closed doors. So uh, the town's attorney said the uh, six-page letter was detailed enough to suggest the, town, the trustees took action in organizing the response to fight, despite the fact the trustees had not hold, held a public meeting since October 19th. I took a look at the request and something jumped out on me. Um, and I don't know how the town operates, but we got a letter from town council, we got a letter from selectmen, but both of the, the right to know laws were out of Mr. Welch's office. And I don't know, that kind of hits me strange, um, but that's where they came from and not out of, out of the council. So I went to the Attorney General's website, and on there there's a document, it's a memorandum of the right to know law, and it kind of explains a little bit better than the RSA does. And if you look at that document, it said what constitutes a meeting of the public body. And essentially, a public body holds a meeting when a quorum of the membership of the public body is convened in person so that all members may communicate contempor contempor well, contemporaneously, contemporaneously. <laughs> and, and the reason for being there has to do with a matter over which you have public use. They then, then go into an email, and it said email should be used carefully limited to avoid an inadvertent, albeit... Uh, meeting where there is a failure to have a physical quorum. Simultaneous email sent to a quorum of a public body by a member discussing proposing action or announcing how one will vote on the matter within the jurisdiction of the body would constitute an improper meeting. So would sequential emails. That would be an improper meeting. One-on-one -on -one emails, not so. Um, we were asked to provide all our emails. So. There are some, I don't know uh, whoever signed that uh, request last week, uh, there are some emails or emails there that do not fall under the uh, right to know. So how did we get to the letter? It's very simple. I wrote it. I wrote it myself. I wrote it in the village in Pinehurst, North Carolina. I communicated with no one. No one from the board, not Mr. Silberdick, not these two gentlemen here, no one. And I'll tell you why I wrote it. It eventually needed to be written. There needed to be a response somewhere. And I did it to jumpstart the process. And I also did it because it upset my wife. 
it upset her as we walked around Pinehurst, the village of Pinehurst, and this letter had come in, and we had discussed it previously, our normal daily walk turned into more of a heated discussion, and I could see that she was concerned. And she finally asked me, are we going to be sued? And I said, nope, I don't think we're going to be sued, but that's the best I can tell you. I did consult with three individuals, however, when writing this. The first one was a lawyer. At my own expense, I went and saw a lawyer uh, who, when I explained the situation, after the laughter died down of what we wanted to do, the lawyer said, in order to file anything for compensation, you have to show damages. By your own admission, you did not see the advertising material. The town was not harmed by investing with the advisor. I also contacted as advised by uh, Mr. Donovan and the board, I contacted the SEC. I talked to a special counsel or I conversed with a special counsel who told me we do not give advice of that nature, even though we were advised to contact them and uh, you should contact the lawyer. I said, okay, that's fine. Finally, I talked to someone who's on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, the Compliance Division. She told me of something called UDAP, an unfair or deceptive acts or practices. It's a three-part test. Essentially, it boils down to, she told me, it doesn't necessarily go across all um, federal agencies, but it's pretty common. They usually look at each other. And essentially, you must, uh, there must be a representation, omission, or practice that misleads or is likely to mislead the consumer. And since we had never seen that material, we obviously were not misled. So that's where we are on the right to know. As I said, I wrote it. I wrote it alone. I sent the first draft to Mr. Silverdick. I sent a second draft when I got a letter from David Mays that answered uh, the Mackinson material, because up to that point, I simply said, I don't know. I don't know anything about Mackinson and the questions that you asked. Once I got that, I sent the final one to Mr. Silverdick, and I said, this is the jump start the process. Do with it what you will. He sent it out to the rest of the board. That was the first I saw on the 28th of December. And on the 29th, he sent it to you, you gentlemen. And that's the story of the right to know and how that article got written. Thank you. I did not, when I received that letter and I sent it out, <coughs> I advised the fellow trustees that this is going out and if they had any comments, they should respond to me. I received comments from Steve and John. They're attached uh, to an, another letter I'm going to give to you now that responds to Mr. Welch's latest letter to us. And hopefully tonight will be the end of this. Um, first of all, I'd like to let you know as chair of the trustees of trust funds on a routine basis, I actually have operating responsibilities. I schedule meetings. I disseminate information to trustees, I run the meetings, I coordinate with the town on bookkeeping matters, and then I interact with the press, I respond to requests for information from the public, other Hampton boards, and other communities. I also attend seminars and communicate with our investment advisor and his staff. There's nothing I'm aware of that limits these responsibilities and authorities. And if I'm exceeding them, my fellow trustees are able to clip my wings or replace me any time they wish. And I've been uh, chair now for the last five years. I do have contact uh, with individual trustees, and I do so in a manner that uh, does not create a quorum. And I never deal with anything associated with our investments, mostly dealing with administrative matters. And uh, uh, so fundamentally, I, I asked David Mays to respond to the 
information on Mackinson and company because only he could provide that information and some of it was confidential and that was indicated in the response. And you had asked us at a prior meeting to reconsider our decision on Mackinson and company and to hold it and uh, have our next meeting televised. And next Monday and the ninth, uh, next Tuesday the 19th, we're having our meeting. It, I've arranged for it to be televised, assuming there is a television function operating at that time. Yeah. And we are holding a uh, non-public session to review Mackinson and uh, David Mays um, amongst the trustees because it's uh, is being held non-public because it could deal with his reputation, etc. And we have a series of questions that have been sent or criteria for evaluating his performance. And then after that, we'll announce what our, what our results are and the public and you all are invited, and invited to attend the meeting and if you have any questions to ask at that time, you're more than welcome to ask them. Um, so I'll provide this, as I said, I'll provide this information to you. Uh, I also would like to sort of uh, finalize this by indicating that the trust fund has generated $642,000 worth of dividend and interest income for this year, about a 3.5% return. We had a very poor year with, the, with respect to the value of the portfolio, which declined due to the uncertainty in the marketplace, and that continues. However, we still have an unrealized gain of approximately 86000 Last year, we generated 696000 I've asked David for a reconciliation between last year's income and this year's because it's down a bit. There was a reimbursement of, of, uh, of, um, of fees that we paid Mackinson and company that were, that were put into the wrong accounts, and rather than trying to do bookkeeping entries, they just reimbursed the, uh, the town for the, for the uh, money that was paid to them. And so I'll have that hopefully... Uh, by next Tuesday, we'll have an analysis of the difference. It's about thirty or forty thousand between last year's dividends and this year's. We did do several transactions, and we went into more into direct uh, investing in bonds versus uh, what we had been doing in the past. So, with that, uh, I'll, I'll provide this to you. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy, or we'll be very happy to address them. Unless you gentlemen want to say anything, you more yeah, I do. Okay, go ahead. So I'll just ask you, um, when you have your meeting, do you allow the, the public come up to comment there? Yes. 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 So do you allow the people to comment before you make the meet with <laughs> no. Mr. Mays? While, while we're meeting. If you have something to say, you, you can yeah, say. But I, mean, I was thinking uh, if you give the, the public a comment to, a chance to comment before you make your decision about Mr. Mays, because that is one of the problems here is uh, a lot of, I think, of what people are, um, uh, from the, a lot of the selectmen I know are concerned about all of the p public that is getting in touch with them, how they feel about Mr. Mays. Okay. I'm just wondering if you're getting a chance to let the public uh, ask questions or, you know, get the feeling of the public before you make your decision. Because that's a lot of what's based here at the Board of Selectmen is the response that we are getting from the public. You know, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, this is my fourth year of doing this. I can remember five people that have been at a meeting. Two of yeah, them no, are in this room. I know, and that, and that is what happens, and that's what happens all the time. And then uh, for months afterwards, people say, well, I didn't know that I could comment or whatever. But uh, I am sure probably that's what will happen again. But... I would think that it would be nice if people did have a chance to comment before you made your decision. And maybe people would come. I don't really know. Uh, well, we're having a non-public first, and we'll have our decision, and then we can, we can uh, ask if the public has any comments and then go back in a non-public if that... That might be a good idea. Might, might yeah. be the, the best way to handle that so that people feel that... Uh, that they have their opportunity to express themselves. Yeah, but we great. generally have uh, in our meetings, given the fact that so few people actually attend them, mm -hmm. 
they can just basically sit around this table and if you have some we'll ask you have a comment to make and people are more than welcome to make them and we sometimes we've had some very good comments so. oh that's good yeah good. mr hartley yeah i i'd like to um get more to the crux of what i think this whole problem uh, stems from it stems from the fact that we had a down year uh, it started in january and it went through the first six months, it recovered a bit. And this past week, it's been down again. And I think people are concerned the fact that the uh, stock market is going down. But I think what you have to understand is right now we have five people elected to the Board of Trustees. And all five of these people have had extensive investment experience. We're professionals. And it makes a big difference when you have professionals dealing with your investments than if you have laymen. And I think in each one of your careers and businesses, uh, you've had people who are laymen, and they don't have the same point of view as you have because of your extensive experience in your profession. And we have the same thing here. Uh, in the past, we haven't had professionals as, as the trustees. When it started way back 25 years ago, uh, we had um, upstanding townspeople, uh, three of them on the board, and they were all well-respected people, but they were investment professionals. And consequently, uh, what they did was they didn't want to take any risk whatsoever. They invested only in CDs or treasuries that could never go down. And because they couldn't go down, they couldn't go up either. They just earned interest, and that was it. Um, if you can't invest in something that will go down, you can't make a gain. And what they did was they let the investments deteriorate on a dollar cost basis because of inflation. And they lost, I'd say, about $8 million doing that over 20 years. Now that we have professionals, we know the difference between in investing uh, for no actual losses versus no losses through inflation. And and we have a uh, real check on what our advisor does because our advisor can't do a darn thing without us approving it. Now, what we do is we set the directions, and the board says 40% stocks, 60% bonds. And when the stocks go down, as they have this year, I look upon that as an opportunity. So I'm an investment professional. And because it's an opportunity, it means we take some of the bonds and reallocate them into stocks so that we maintain the 60-40 split. And then when the market comes back, as it always does, we have that 40% uh, in, in, in new investments that can go up real quick as soon as the market comes back, much quicker than if we hadn't done that. And so these are the things that investment professionals do and, and we can do. And, and we understand that the, the uh, in investing public uh, will look at their own investments, and they will say, we have a time horizon based on when we retire or when we expect to die. Uh, this fund doesn't have a time horizon. This is an endowment. This is like Harvard University's endowment. It has no end. It goes on forever. So we don't have to worry about the fact that we have a loss this year um, that won't come back for another three years or whatever. Whereas some private person worries that they're going to retire when their stocks are way down and they have to sell out to live. And so we have a different point of view, and our point of view is based on the fact that we're professional investors. And we know how to do this, and we know the fact that the, the long time horizon that this uh, fund has uh, makes it possible for us to take advantage of that and, and invest in things. When they go down, we can take things from bonds and put them in stocks. If the, if the bonds go down, we can take things from stocks and put them in bonds. So when each one recovers, we're way ahead of the game. And so what I caution people to uh, understand is that we are high professionals, and we hire an investment advisor. And the investment advisor does what we tell them. Now, they do the details. If we say 40% in stocks, they make recommendations to what the 40% should be invested in. If we say 60% in bonds, 
uh, they make recommendations as to what they should invest 60% in. And then we approve that. And if we don't like what they do, we tell them to change it, and they do. And so, really, the investment performance is something that we're responsible for and not Mackinson and Company. Mackinson's Company just does what we do. We tell them to do. Mr. Chairman. And so I, I want you to uh, uh, understand that what people who are talking to you are basing their comments on their own uh, experience, and they're not necessarily professionals, and they don't have the same background that we do. So I, I, want, I want you to understand that, that Magnuson and Company does what we tell them to do, and they charge us about one-tenth of what other, another firm would tell us, because we did put it out for bid a few years ago, and Magnuson and Company was bidding at one-tenth of one percent as their fee. Nobody else came even close to that. So we look upon the, the fee that we pay to Magnuson <coughs> as, as a bargain, and they, they do what we tell them to do, and they make recommendations that we adopt or we don't adopt. So I just want you to understand that as, as investment professionals, we have a different point of view than the general public. And I, I think that our point of view is superior because of our experience. Okay. May I, may I respond? Right because now. you, Mr. Chairman, said why I responded, why I reacted to this thing. and. Mr. You also said why I responded. It had nothing to do with performance. The performance has been good. It had nothing to do with the performance. It had everything to do with integrity. And any company that I was going to be doing business with, and I think that the town should be doing business with, should have an absolutely impeccable integrity uh, record. And I think we talked about this, that there was a fine, that Mr. Mackinson was the one who did it, whether it's a mistake or not. He was a compliance officer. He was running the company. He owned the company. So mistake, you throw it right out. The fact is there was a fraud or there was an uh, infraction, and it was fined for that infraction. Correct. When you came in to meet with us, and I'll tell you why my feeling, when you came in to meet with us, we talked about whether Mr. Mackinson was still on the board. And at that time, it was said Mr. Mackinson was not on the board, I believe. And we said, okay, and then it came to light that Mr. Mackinson is still on the board. He has nothing to do with the daily operation, but if you're on the board of directors, you do have something to do with the company. So from that aspect, it was simply a question in my mind of integrity, and I felt that a sooner meeting, an earlier meeting, would be good for the public to know transparently what was going on. Not that the funds were in danger, never felt that the funds were in danger, but I felt that there was an integrity question. And that back in 2010, there was a big question mark, and Mr. Mackinson had to uh, leave the board. Because, so there has been a question along, and that's what people have said to me. People have not talked to me about the performance necessarily or danger of the funds. They've talked to me, and people who know what they're talking about, and people who have been in town for a long time, uh, they've talked to me about the integrity, and is there a question of integrity? And if there is a question of integrity, it's not how well we're doing, should we move on? Then move to the right to know law. We receive a letter that's on official trustees of the trust stationery. Okay. It's signed by Norm Silberman. Therefore, and in it it says not my opinion, it says our, O-U-R, opinion. Therefore, the only assumption that I can make is that somehow each one of the board of trustees, that's their opinion. So there's some kind of a vote that had to take place for that letter to be put out. Now, your communication here, John, is very good tonight. It helps an awful lot. It might help if people didn't go to the newspaper all the time writing editorials and accusing people of doing things illegally. We never accused the trustees of the trust doing anything illegally. We came and said we have questions on these specific issues. We have a legitimate question on the right to know law. It's on official stationery, and it says our, O-U, our. Not my, not one person's, it says ours. The only interpretation I have from that is that a meeting took place or correspondence took place, or somebody is taking too much authority by saying our by speaking for the whole board without having a vote. That's, that's solely where I'm coming from, nothing to do with performance, nothing to do with professionals. I respect all of your opinions. I respect that you're 
taking care of the trust, that you're doing it there. But this has blown out of proportion, and I think it could have been handled a lot better from your aspect. We might have inflamed it also. We probably could have handled it a lot better. Definitely. But it was inflamed, and it was inflamed, I think, by egos get involved, and uh, we don't have good communication. Jim, just to, to make mention, I have from uh, my training as, a, as an auditor way back when in the, in the 60s with Singer Sewing Machine Company, in writing memorandums, I had a very difficult time ever using the word I and tried uh, not to use uh, any pronouns. But in this case, <coughs> I should have used I versus our. And I did because that's just my personality, not... I'm not uh, ego driven to be doing but, but, that. But I think you can see why. I can understand. I can see why we have a 91A, why we say that there must have been a meeting that took place. That's all I have to say. Did you want to comment too? I, I saw you there with your. I, I mean, the only thing I can say is <coughs> I mean, I read the article Friday when we, uh, on Monday when we got back from Vermont, and it, it seems like an opinion had been formed between our town council and you, Rusty. I mean, it was kind of shocked especially by our town council, that, that an opinion had already been formed. Okay, well... well that, that we had a meeting, that a, a meeting was held. So that's what you would like to say? That's, so, that's, what, that's all I have to say. Mr. Bridal. Yes, and, and, and mine is the very reason that he did he, what he said, that we, it was our. I understand. And it was signed by Norm. It wasn't signed by you. I appreciate what you come tonight and told us. I very much appreciate that. I appreciate how, how the, the funds have been going. But when we hear our... And it was sent to the paper to us. Yep. So the public's out there re reading it. Yep. The public doesn't see you guys. They come and talk to us. I'm in this town all, every day, all day. I see people all over the place, and they're going, we're reading about this in the paper. It's a trust issue. We have, a, a, I may be one of those laymen, but I hire an advisor. And I'll tell you, I wouldn't hire an advisor that they had a trust issue with. And, so, and that's what we get. So when it says our, that's the problem. I understand. And it was sent to the paper. The paper got it. People came to me and said, what is going on? We hear these guys aren't meeting. They're not doing this. And by the look of this, you had a meeting. I understand. So that was, that was what my concern. It did not have anything to do with the town attorney. I asked him about it. I said, look at this. So Let's go back, Rusty, and go back to your 14th uh, December letter. Uh, Mr. Donovan had already put out that letter. It was written to the trustees. It wasn't written to the Board of Selectmen. It was to the trustees and all the towns. Mm -hmm. Okay? When the 14th December letter came out, all it did was parrot what Mr. Donovan said. It underlined it <coughs> and it made threats <coughs> that we're going to discipline you, we're going to do X, Y, and Z in that letter. I'm telling you, that's what upset my wife when we were walking around. Are we going to get sued? It was a letter. I don't know who wrote it. It shouldn't have been written that way. There should have been some other type of communication. It could have very easily been diffused if somebody called over to Donovan's office and said, are these directions? As I mentioned before, the verbs and adverbs used in there from contract language is not directive in nature. And as you just said, it was sent to you. That's correct. And we never hear, heard anything about it. As was the SC, the Security Exchange Commission sanction sent to you, and you guys voted on it that night. You were in here that night talking to us, and you never once mentioned it. We didn't find out about it till afterwards. And then we found out about this afterwards. You gotta hear our point too. I hear I'm hearing point. from the public. I the hear public your point. doesn't appreciate it. I hear your point, and, and you're right. It, it should have been probably, it probably should have been a better communication, and we need to learn from that and the communication. But this idea of we're going to discipline you, we're going to do whatever it is, is just on call for. It gets everybody's rackles up, and we don't like that. And you don't like that. You don't like in public uh, for people to say things, and, and we don't either. So, I mean, if but we don't where, learn from that's this... That's where it has to be said. But if we don't learn from this, we're, we're going to do it all over again. So we need to learn from this experience. We need to put it behind us. We need to start back out. There was no 
um, violation of the public's right to know. Ida can't remember honestly whether I wrote I or our when I wrote those drafts. I, I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look at the drafts. Perhaps I sent the draft to Mr. Silverdick. I said, here's a draft to jumpstart this procedure. Do with it what you will. That was it. That was the only communication that took place. And, and we understand that now, but you got to see that it said our. I, I understand that. Our means of vote. And, and yeah, you I'm know, kidding. I didn't see that. I was on the road. I drove from North Carolina to South Carolina, and I thought everything was hunky-dory until I got back up here, and all of a sudden I get a dear trustee email. Yeah. I go, what the heck is going on? I thought this would be over by now. Yeah. <clears throat> so, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Welch, would you like to say something? I think it's all been said. Thank you. Mrs. Wolseley. Now, gentlemen, I want to make it clear that my signature on that December 14 letter should not have been there. I voted against sending the letter. But when we get a stack of stuff like that with little tags to sign, I admit I signed without as part of a, a lump. Um, I am getting calls from the public, too, and one call that uh, interested me greatly was from a lady who said we're sitting out here wondering why you guys are not um, disciplining or taking to task the trustees and I said well you need to understand that the trustees do not work for the Board of Selectmen the trustees are independent elected officials and they are responsible and whoever in the Attorney General's office is responsible for overseeing trustees of trust funds, it's their problem, not ours. I am very concerned that this has grown uh, way out of proportion. Uh, I think that the, uh, the letters and memos that have been sent to the trustees are insulting. Um, I have attended some of the trustees meetings uh, once with Mr. Waddell when Mr. Waddell was present and Mr. Jones is in the back of the room and he was at another and I have been allowed to make comments and Mr. Jones made comments and I can't remember whether you did Jim but you probably did uh, it's a very open type of meeting um, I had I had a message on my answering machine end of August from the um, administrative assistant saying, Mary Louise, the chairman has called a meeting uh, on, on September 2nd at 7 p.m. Can you make it? So I don't like to leave things dangling. I picked up the phone and Christina's answering machine picked up and I just said, I'm fine with tomorrow night. I'll be there. Um, then overnight I was thinking about it and I said I wonder what's going on because I hadn't had any other information from anyone so I called her back in the morning and I said what's happening why are we meeting tonight I can make it but why are we going to be there and she said oh it's about the trustees of the trust funds and I thought well that's kind of weird but I'll go so I went and I talked to uh, the uh, town council on my way into the meeting and I said I'm not quite sure why we are meeting but the trustees of the trust funds are independent elected officials and I see no need for a non-public session under RSA 91 and town council said oh oh we don't want to compromise people's reputations and damage their reputations and whatever now I went on into the meeting frankly to see what was going on and Mr. Griffin turned the meeting over to Mr. Bean, who had requested the meeting. And Mr. Bean mentioned something about not damaging the reputations of the trustees because they're all local men and they have... Uh, and by the way, the minutes are not sealed, although they are not mm. verbatim. And he said these are all local men and they have businesses and so forth, and we don't want to damage anybody's reputation. But the next piece of paper that was passed around the table was a copy of an opinion piece that Mr. Silverdick wrote as a private individual that was printed in the newspaper. That is irrelevant for a non-public meeting. Nothing was mentioned about any of the other gentlemen who are trustees, and I took that, quite frankly, as a longtime resident of this town and a longtime <laughs> public servant as a direct attack on Mr. Silverdick as an individual who happens to be a trustee. 
And I think that's inappropriate. And I mentioned to the board while we were in the meeting that we should not be doing that because I felt and still feel that that was an illegal uh, meeting, uh, non-public meeting. Uh, we, I think this has gone way overboard. I think this has bordered on or, or actually constitutes harassment of another public body. I think what has happened here is unacceptable. And I, for one, at this point in time, want nothing to do with it, but I caution this board, we should be keeping our noses out of things <coughs> like this. We have no authority here. And if the Attorney General wants to go running around after boards of trustees in the state, let them do it. That is not our problem. And I am really, really appalled at, look at, look at all this, all this stuff. All this stuff. And they have done absolutely nothing wrong, and they are independent elected officials. And if they tried telling us what to do, boy, you'd be upset. Uh, I am. Are you finished, Mrs. Wolf? I am. Well, I am. Mr. B. Reading my remarks. Thank you. Um, we, we all have. And I'm annoyed. Here. Um, uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, thank you for coming in tonight. John, I'm sorry about your vacation. And nobody, nobody, nobody ever talked about a tort against uh, the trustees. You've uh, returned uh, great results for a lot of years. Last year was a hard year. You have uh, tens and tens of millions of dollars under management. It's not an easy job. Uh, where Rusty sits, where Jim sits, where Mr. Welsh sits, that's that's not an easy job either. And uh, while um, sometimes we've exchanged. Um, uh, perhaps editorial comment or comment in the newspaper. Uh, it has never been about uh, an ad hominem issue. It's never been about personality. It's been about safeguarding uh, $21 million. It's been about living up to our responsibilities under RSA, under the town of Hampton, and under state law. And I could read um, John Triano's uh, email that he sent to you on the 28th and continue to, to, to stroke this flame and, and, and do those things. I know the board in the majority feels very strongly about their, their, um, their looking into this matter. And uh, Mr. Silberdick, Mr. Chairman, you say rightly, would like to move past. Uh, and that's notwithstanding Jim's comments and Rusty's comments, and that uh, federal, federal regulators and state regulators have had an interest in it. But for the good of the town, and, and for the good of our collective efforts, I think it's important that we uh, recognize that there have been some um, actions that have come to the attention. I think it was only right that the Board of Selectmen raised those issues. There was an anonymous letter actually sent to me, and I knew nothing of this. And I would expect each of you, were you to receive that information, to do the same thing. And I would, I would expect any elected official to do it um, the way we have done it. But it has never been personal. Um, oftentimes, uh, these small town um, uh, politics, if you will, um, do get a little barefisted. And uh, I, I learned that first uh, hand on this board. And uh, sometimes it's not fun. <coughs> sometimes uh, the pay isn't that great. But you have done uh, a remarkable job in totality as, as trustees. And uh, I think it is important that, uh, um, that your board, through your chairman in one voice, uh, have better dialogue with um, the town attorney, with the town manager, and the chairman. Um, and I, I don't think there's enough of that. And that, that's just a suggestion. And I think it will um, uh, stop some of uh, this forward progress and rehashing and rehashing and he said and she said and he said and he said and he said because that's getting us nowhere and it is Hampton. So um, I'm looking forward uh, to moving forward collectively. I thank you for your service and um, please tell Mr. Triano that um, uh, the board, I think, collectively uh, may feel the same way. Thank you very much. I have a follow-up question <coughs> yeah. to the manager. Let, let other people speak. Mrs. You're always Wilson. shutting me up. I have well, a I am follow. shutting you up I right now because I haven't had a chance to talk. Right, but I have a we will come back to you when it's your turn to talk. Thank you. Please stop. Mr. Wardell, do you have anything oh. else to say? No, I've. Okay, and you know one of the things I would like to go into is I think one thing that does scare the public is just the whole idea that it's a hundred thousand dollar fine. You know, when people hear that, they don't hear anything else except that. And that's why people may be questioning. Um, I just wanted to say uh, that when Mrs. Wolsey was pontificating about what was going on at the, at the private meeting, 
Um, the only reason that the private meeting was held, as far as I'm concerned, although it was done at the request of somebody else, was to protect your reputations and um, Mr. Mays and Mr. Uh, Warren Mackinson. That's the only reason why I would have. And I personally, I feel bad about your wife because I'm pretty much every, sure that everybody here has felt that at some point at the beginning of their service to the town or whatever. It takes a while to get to realize exactly how it all works. And um, I'm sure your wife must have, you know, that's she not fair. Okay. She yeah. was all right after a while. After I assured her we weren't going to be sued. So and she kind of calmed down at that point. Many times I have to run down here the first thing in the morning to find out if, we're, you know, if I've said something that would cause me a problem. So those things do happen. But I think mainly um, that's the only, as far as I'm concerned, last week the vote was three and two extent, uh, extent, um, ex abstentions. Extensions. <clears throat> and the reason why I abstained is because I think it's overblown and I felt that way right from the beginning. But I still seem to be the victim of um, these letters in the newspaper that don't reflect my position at all. So that I feel bad about. And I, but I, I'm over that. I don't, I don't even think about it anymore because it's oh. happened for years. Well, it's kind of that way when you're on a board. You're the board yeah, selected but, or you're a trustee. But as, as to the fine, I have another one that I have in here and it's a very almost exactly the same as Mackinson. The gentleman lives in Wyndham, New Hampshire. He works out of uh, North Andover. It was adjudicated and done in uh, December 18, 2012, $200,000 for the exact same offense. <coughs> he hired a lawyer at $1,500 an hour and reduced it to $200,000. So I was appalled that the first time when I saw $100,000, what could have happened, but you have to put it in perspective. And I also need to say that David Mays was employed at the company at that time, and the SEC did not cite him. And that needs to be taken into account. We're going to meet next week. I get one vote, same as these gentlemen. My only allegiance is to do the right thing for the trust funds, for the town, and for the taxpayers. I can't be concerned with what people are saying. Somebody is not going to be happy next week, either our present advisor or the people out there that think we ought to move on to somebody else. And if we do or if we don't, it's going to be, you know, we're in a situation where we're going to be criticized one way or the other, no matter what we do. And ultimately, people decide when they vote. And that's, I think, the most important thing. I feel kind of bad for Mr. Hartley because there's a lot of people that are probably going to blame you. And, you know, I'm sure that uh, you've done nothing wrong. But, you know, we'll see. It's, uh, that's how it goes in the votes. You but know, the, this is my second time on the board, and both times they've been unopposed that I ran. There's not a lot of people out there. There's not the interest. Nobody wants to come in and be the spear catcher. He, he, got, God's sakes. That's the problem. he got more votes than <laughs> I did last time. <laughs> well, we're on the same cycle, and we were both on opposed the last two times. There is a seat open, as you said. My wife asked if it was mine. I said, <laughs> unfortunately not. No, it's not. But there's a seat open, and everybody that thinks they know how to do it better can go file. That's true, and I'm all for that. Mrs. Walsley. Uh, according to the statute, the right to know law, um, if uh, matters which, if discussed in public, would likely affect adversely the reputation of any person other than a member of the public body itself, that would have been us, if they uh, wishes, such person may request an open meeting. Did anybody contact you prior to the meeting that we held that I was concerned was an illegal meeting? Anybody call you and ask to be heard at that no, meeting? Ma no, ma'am. I, I, no, I sent an email. Mr. Silberdick was invited. Was, were you invited? Yeah, I sent it at the last moment. I did send an email saying I prefer the meeting be held in uh, 
in public because if you had any criticism relating to our performance mm -hmm. as trustees, you sent that to the board. Yeah. We, Should you know, we all, and I always prefer that all the meetings be done in public, mm -hmm. but you just really never know what someone's going to say sometimes. And I think there was a lot, I mean, as far as someone's reputation. Right. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't even want to go there. I don't like taking shots at people uh, in public, particularly here at the Selectman's meeting. And I do see it happen more often than I would like. Any other comments? I Thank you for not. coming in tonight. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. And I cry easily under criticism. <laughs> Jim. Mr. Welch, you want those uh, right to know letters, or are we done with this? I, did, I, I, presented. I think he presented them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean mine. I didn't. Oh. Well, that's fine. If you want to turn them over, just put it on the file. Yeah, I have the same two <coughs> letters. They were the 28th and 29th. Right. That's not. not yeah. That'll make sure that nobody can complain that wasn't there. I read about the uh, history of Pinehurst on at one point. Did you ever figure out? It, the guy was from Boston. James Tufts is the guy's name. Is he the he same guy that did Tufts University? That's what I was trying to figure he out. Built a, he wanted to build a um, New England village, I guess, in the sand hills there. And it is, if you've never been there, it, it is really. It's a New England village. You yeah. see, that kind of says, Jesus is New England. But we drove 900 miles to a New England village. <laughs> She lives there with her family, and uh, we go there quite often. And, and really like I looked it up because uh, my father was from Pinehurst, Massachusetts, but it had nothing to do with Pinehurst. Yeah, Pinehurst, Mass is down near Hanscom by the, yeah. Yeah, by the base. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank Annie, you. Oakley, Thank you. Annie Oakley actually went, and they had a gun range there, and she shot at Pinehurst. <laughs> Thank you for, for the information. Yes, <clears throat> Moving on to the town manager's report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the closing day for proposed warrant articles for Petition. is tomorrow. Petitioned warrant articles that are proposed is tomorrow, January 12, 2016, at 5 p.m. They should be filed in the selectman's office. Um, those property owners who desire to apply for an abatement of taxes an exemption from taxes under the elderly exemption provisions, veterans tax credit, blind exemptions, or other exemptions under RSA 72, or to apply for the optional lower tax rate for the Hampton Beach Village Precinct uh, and District should visit the assessor's office for the necessary forms to complete the file before March 1. The annual budget public hearing so the budget committee is scheduled for Tuesday evening, January 14th, 2016. Thursday, uh, Excuse me, Thursday. Thursday. I'm, I'm reading a couple lines I down know. already. I know. Uh, Thursday, January 14th, 2016, at 7 p.m. in the Academy. The auction for 27 Pearl Street is to be held on the property at 3 p.m. on January 29th, 2016. And I have from the Public Works Department, which they sent in to me, and I'm sure everybody will be interested. Um, Christmas trees will be picked up curbside this week, yeah. and I know that they'll continue to check just to make sure that uh, uh, something doesn't come out late. They always do. Um, unfortunately, I understand we're due for good snow tomorrow. So, and if uh, people will not wrap the trees in plastic, please, someone yes. put them in bags. Yeah, just, just please, just put the tree out. We'll pick Thank it you. up from the uh, <laughs> yeah. from the, uh, the the edge of the road or from the snow plow pile, whatever is there. And for the board's information, we have returned the bid, the deposit, deposit and security for the Ice Pond Dam bid, uh, which is, has, will not be awarded because of costs. Okay. That's it, sir. Okay. Comments? Fine. Mr. Bridal? All set. Thank you. Now it's your time to talk, Mrs. Wellesley. Oh, that's very exciting. Um, Mr. Uh, Welch, would you, in a subsequent uh, agenda, uh, under town manager or business uh, put something about uh, audio uh, <coughs> replacement for I believe it's under new business system. item number one uh, Mrs. Wolsey oh repair well that's for repair but I'm thinking of just buying a new unit I'll, I'll discuss it at the both. same time so you okay. have it tonight all right Mr. Bean no sir Thank you for your report Mr. Welch thank you Mr. Chairman moving on to old business N number one, warrant articles. Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, uh, there are a number of warrant articles that we need to have the board approve. 
as we go through this process. Uh, the first one listed is the Heritage Fund. We have diligently and uh, crazily searched the entire statutory scheme for New Hampshire. Originally, there was a provision in the general laws uh, before they were recodified that allowed the discontinuance of a heritage fund, the funds to be returned to the town general fund. Mm -hmm. That was removed by the legislature for some strange Very reason. Brief. So we need a warrant article to, in fact, do that since the Heritage Commission no longer exists. Mm -hmm. So this warrant article is designed to do that, and we need the permission of the Board of Selectmen to place that on the warrant. Yes, I'll so move, Mr. Chairman. Second. All those in favor, unanimous. It will be Article 34. Yes, ma'am. At least at this point. Yes. Uh, the next one, Mr. Chairman, is a land transfer to SAU 90, which is Article Number 39. Uh, we've discussed this, I believe, at your last meeting, and we need the board's permission to place that on the warrant. Also move, Mr. Chairman. I'll second it. All those in favor? Just one thing. The question was at our last meeting was to. If they didn't use it, it came back to us, and that has been put in here, correct? Yes, sir, it has. Thank There's you. a reverter clause There's a reverter in it. clause. Yeah. All those in favor, unanimous. Mr. Chairman, the next item is the discontinuance of a portion of Old Park Avenue. <coughs> um, when the state rerouted Route 1 uh, going north, uh, they abandoned a portion, at least for their use, um, a portion of Old Park Avenue, which was at the time Route 1. Uh, it's still sitting out there in limbo. It's causing a problem for two abutting properties. We need to discontinue a portion of it so both properties can continue to have a legal frontage but can share the frontage uh, appropriately. And there, there is a, a future subdivision coming up, and I believe a purchase of the two lots by one individual but who wishes to keep them as separate lots. Uh, this will allow him to do that. It will allow him to have access to both parcels of property and uh, will allow us to tax more property. I'll make a his request, and we're, we're forwarding it if you, re if you uh, desire. I'll make a motion that we uh, accept Article 42 as presented. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, yeah Jim. All those in favor? I'm opposed. Or four to yeah. one. Uh, the next one, Mr. Chairman, is to rescind the Management Information System Capital Reserve Fund. Uh, that fund is there. It has been there, I believe, since 1997. There is almost $30,000 in it. Uh, the Budget Committee has asked that we can have the Board consider uh, bringing that fund forward and placing that, those funds within the budget, so to speak, uh, through the warrant article to uh, purchase upgrades to the existing IT system. So moved. Second. All those in favor, unanimous. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the next one deals with the Conservation Commission. I don't know if the chairman's here or not. Yes, yeah, I think you I want saw, to come up yeah. to the table. Jay. Sure. We'd be delighted. Good this, evening. This right now is Article 32. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Hello, Hello. Jay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. I'm Jay Diener, Chair of the Conservation Commission, and this has to do with the warrant article that is asking for an allocation to our fund for the purposes of acquiring, maintaining, protecting open land. Um, let me give you just a briefly a little background here. Um, this fund was established by warrant article in 1987, and at that point in time, the fund was called the Cons Conservation Commission Land Accumulation Fund. In 1991, I don't know exactly how this happened, the name was changed to the Conservation Land Fund. Sometime after that, it was changed to the Conservation Land Acquisition Fund. <laughs> the Budget Committee, and I think rightly so, asked us, how many funds do you have and what's going on here? And so they've asked us to rework this warrant article such that it reflects the fact that we're dealing with one fund and that all of our funds, all of the monies for this purpose are going into just one fund, which we're calling the Conservation Fund. And so in here, we've added the language. The Conservation Fund also includes previously approved allocations for the same or similar purposes made to the Conservation Commission Accumulation Fund, the Conservation Land Fund, and the Conservation Land Acquisition Fund. 
Other than that, it's it's the same as the article that was presented earlier and that we've presented in years past this year asking for $20,000 that we can use towards projects to acquire land or conservation easements on property for the benefit of the town. And again, we're doing this to build this fund up slowly rather than having to come to the taxpayers in Hampton to ask, ask for a large chunk of money whenever the opportunity <coughs> presents itself. So that very quickly is, is why we're here tonight and why we're asking for a change on this warrant article and hopefully for your approval to move this forward. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I also move to accept. Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, this um, hopefully makes it very plain that this one fund Good. Uh, it may be held in various yeah. in various ways to earmark funds that have been donated to the town for special reasons and so forth, but it will all be under one fund. Uh, comments? Mr. Waddell? No, sir. Mr. Bridal? No, I think this cleared it up. I think uh, we had some questions about there were funds for the marsh and stuff. So uh, we were given specifically for that, and I know the treasurer earmarks those, but it's in the one fund. Right. Mrs. Wolseley? So moved to accept. Second. All those in favor, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. You bet. Mr. Chairman, the next to last one, because there's one that's not listed here, <clears throat> is the Park and Recreation Infrastructure Infrastructure Fund, which is article number, right now, article two, number 27. It was suggested at the Budget Committee meeting uh, that the selectmen consider uh, taking the maintenance sums, that is maintenance of parks, uh, which is up to $34,750, yes, $34,750, and removing that from the budget and placing that in the infrastructure fund uh, so that the maintenance of parks would come out from that fund that was funded by the parking lots. That would require a change to the warrant article and it would require a change to the budget. Questions? We have the Park and Recreation Directors here. Yeah. Did you want to join us at the table? What would you say? Well, the, um, the warrant article was established in 2007 for capital projects and repairs, capital repairs. And that's the 20% money that comes out, comes from the parking lots. Right. So since 2007, we've done a number of projects. We've built an inline hockey rink, the tennis courts were rebuilt, um, the lights went up at Eaton Park. All those are capital projects that we've done with this. I'm very much against taking the maintenance money out of the regular general fund budget that we have because that money is for regular everyday maintenance of the parking of the parks. If something breaks down, we don't know what that's going to be. We have money there to do it. We have some money in there right now um, for repairs to the skateboard park. We're not building a skateboard park. We're just repairing something at it. So we've got some extra money in for that. And we've got some general money in there for Tuck Field, for Lou Brown Park, for the different, pro different parks that we maintain, for the playgrounds. All of that money is for playgrounds. That's for everyday repairs and general maintenance of the parks and I feel like the intent of the warrant article was for the capital projects the intent of the budget is for the general parks department what we do every day in our in our job and I don't mean to be staring at you Rick I'm sorry but um, so I'm very much against this and I feel that it needs to stay right where it is and I hope that you all feel that way as well Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, obviously you have the power to do this, uh, but I will remind you that if you take the $34,750 out of that budget, it also comes out of the default budget. And that simply means that uh, it's no longer a default until the next time we pass a real budget, which means the Park Department will have no grounds maintenance funds until we do right. it. Because and it will disappear from the following budget. Uh, unless the following budget is approved by the town meeting. Right, and I understand trying to put it into this other budget, but that, that, in that, into that warrant article, but that warrant article has failed in past years too. So if that fails and we take that money and put it there, I'm stuck in the mud again. I just can't do my job this way. Mr. Wardell. 
I support the recreation director. I mean, we, we had a report tonight on how much goes on in the recreation department, how much our parks are used. If you go any time in the spring, summer, or fall, <coughs> and you see how often there are people at the parks, softball, baseball, soccer, little kids, lacrosse. I mean, it's used all the time. To take out maintenance money is insane, I think. Mr. Bridal. It's a very slippery slope if we pull that out of there. She has a budget for doing regular maintenance. If it does, if, the, if it's put into the Warren article, the Warren article doesn't pass, then she has no money for maintenance. And that will essentially shut down our parks. Right. Because she'll have no work money to do it. So I think we need to leave it where it is. It's not the intent of the Warren article. It's not the intent of the original Warren article. And I think we should leave it where it is. Thank you. Mrs. Wolseley. I move that we take no action. I concur with the uh, department head. Mr. Bean. I have nothing more to say, sir. And I also agree. Um, I'll second her motion. All those in favor? No action. Right. No unanimous. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, there is one other article. We have it currently listed as Article Number 28, which is the Compensated Leave Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. We have, per your previous instructions, uh, organized a transfer from the general budget to that uh, to that fund from the uh, uh, the appropriate uh, payroll accounts uh, for transition from leaving prime properties uh, employees leaving uh, employment. Uh, and I would ask on that basis to withdraw that article. So moved. Also, second. All those in favor? You're on a roll. Unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Other old business. Mr. Waddell? Uh, no, sir. Mr. Bridal? Nothing at this time. Mrs. Wolseley? Oh. Moving on to new business. Approval of audio system repair for Channel 22. Mr. Welch. Chairman, um, I'm not sure anybody at home can hear this, but <laughs> we'll, we'll give her a good shot. Uh, our audio system has broken down. Um, I have no authority under a uh, prior vote of the board to repair it, to purchase new equipment, or to do anything else. So I believe that the organization has sent that out by parcel post, mm -hmm. and you'll get an explanation of that for repair. Uh, mm -hmm. I will remind the board that at the time that we gave our spare system to the school, Channel 22 requested that the town purchase through the board a new system so we would have an auxiliary. Mr. And the Chairman, board voted okay. no. I'm picking up traffic out of your, yeah. the audience. Okay. okay, please, no talking in the audience. Mr. Welch. <clears throat> uh, Thank you. As a result, we have no backup system for this system for the audio system. And I believe that Channel 22 is here this evening to discuss that and ask you for permission to do various things. Well, I just wanted to also, first of all, I did send out the, um, the Nexus. Uh, we sent it next day so we can get it back as quick as possible. And it did cost uh, $320 to send it out and insure it. So I wanted to, and I'm, that's a little bit over my uh, allowed per day or right. uh, expenditure, but that, that was on me. I figured instead of waiting for today to do it then, uh, so we can get it back by hopefully tomorrow or probably Wednesday. Yeah. Okay, because they're going to send it back next day air also, and it is under warranty because it's got a five-year warranty. As far as getting another one, um, we talked about that, yeah. and uh, it was. $17,000, and even I thought that's a lot of money to be sitting on the shelf and the warranty to be running. So, I mean, if we had it on the shelf, it'd already be two years into its warranty. I think that's, I don't know when we talked about it, maybe a year, year and a half ago. If this would have happened in the middle of the summer, it probably wouldn't have been a big deal, but of course it happens right now in budget season, so it's, it's tough. Um, there's not much we could have done about it. It just went. I mean, it was a bad day Thursday. The, the van died, and <laughs> that's being fixed under warranty. Uh, and then we lost this. And I, I, the sound was going. Mary Louise did, you know, come in Monday and said it was bad. And I said, all right, we'll look into it. And then it got worse. And then I got other reports, and then it was gone. So 
There's not much we can do but wait. Hopefully get it back before the uh, public meeting, the uh, budget pub public meeting, and we'll have it set up. The only other expense is we're going to have to pay for the IT department to uh, install it and get us going. So, other than that, it's under warranty. Thank you. Mr. Bridal. First thing, Brian, I want to make sure everybody knows that although these meetings aren't live, they are being taped and they're shown pretty regularly afterwards, aren't they? They will be. They'll be bounced right one after the other. Even all the budget meetings, we'll put them on one after the other and try to catch up. So although people may have not seen in this meeting tonight, they'll probably see, be able to see it tomorrow? Um, well, with Paul is putting up, we, we, he made an arrangement with electronics to get them up on the web. It, it takes a long time, a lot longer than normal. Usually it takes three or four hours for it to upload. Now it's taken 12 hours because that's just, they're, they're doing something special for us. They're, they're trying to implement it for everybody so we can, we, have, we can get the meetings up on the web. But other than that, as soon as it gets back, we'll start playing them. Is there... Is there any possibility of buying a remanufactured one as I've, our spare? I've looked, and they're hard to find. I found them on eBay. Uh, I'd have to, ch and they're, they're, most of them aren't working, so maybe I could send them in. I'll, I'll investigate that, whether I'll call Electronic and see if that's possible. That's something they'll do if I were to buy one, send it to them, because it, it's only $400 for them to go through it and, and, uh, Fix it. and, and rebuild it, right. you know. Uh, but that's the only place I found when I've asked uh, Access AV, who's our dealer, and they, they, they don't have any. So okay. I'm just, I'm just. No, I'd love thinking to get out there. Thinking yeah. if, if you know, seventeen thousand dollars, if we can find a re one that we can have remanufactured as our spare, and it would that also would give be, us, yeah, it would give it us would, a spare for us and for Channel Thirteen. Well, in, in a couple of years, we'll be, Looking you know, on. we'll be getting a new one. We'll be Correct. trading that. That will be the spare, but. You know, you, you just gamble a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and we did, when we did Channel 13, that was where our spare went. It did, you know. So, but, um, you know, it, it, it's never, I don't know if we've ever, since I've been, had to send it back. It's usually they could fix it. They, they have control of it. They can take control of it and fix it. But it, this is a physical, a lot of times it's software. This is not software. It's hardware. It has something actually burnt in the sound system in it. So. Thank you, Ron. Okay. I personally think that um, we should just go like how you've been doing it and um, and using this one as a spare sometime down the road. Um, yeah, well, right. right now, I mean, with our budget, I mean, our our uh, fund the way it is, it would it would cut us right to the bone if we had to buy it right now. Yeah, I think it's amazing the good job that you do and that you take all this on like it's your own business, and uh, we have to owe you a lot of thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Wolseley. Yeah, I, t I take issue a little bit, Brian, with the just wet stuff. I've been complaining about the sound since the summer, and I have gone in a number of times and talked to you guys before one of our meetings, and the sound was getting worse to the point where I believe I told you that on my living room television I was going up from a normal sound level of 20 to a sound level well, of Well, you're 80. the only one, Mrs. Uh, Wolseley, that comes right. in and tells me. You tell me that every time, and uh, I, I don't know whether you should get a new TV set. I really don't. Mm -hmm. Because I... You're the only one who tells me that I would take to heart if everybody was coming to oh, you got problems. I listen to it at my house, yeah. and I listen to it here, yeah, and I don't hear it as bad. So yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. You know, we adjust had, it as we can. I, oh, I know that. And, 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 I, I, and having I, this moved over to the uh, fire department has made it so much harder. Maybe yeah. it's her drop. Mm -hmm. but no. It could be her drop. No, it it's not drop. my drop, because I can see the other the school meetings and everything is fine. But, you know... I, and I have been getting complaints from the public that people well, can't I don't get them. you got to send I, it to me. Have I'm them nervous. call me, right. and then I'll listen right. to them. But I'm nervous about having no backup now that we have two, one for the school and one for here, mm -hmm. and if one of them goes, we're stuck. And this is a terrible week to have this happen, well, a dreadful it's, it's, week. And we, we knew that. It could happen. It could happen. Well, Mr. B. Negative, sir. Mr. Waddell. Yeah, you know, got to get it fixed. Absolutely. That's what I agree 100% with well. you. Um, Fred, so you can't, you have no authority over this board remove my authority to spend any money or do anything for Channel 22. Oh, that's not nice. Okay. Okay. I mean, does that make it more difficult when we have a position? <laughs> like, when we, because 
you know, what would expedite when you have something like this, you know, so that you guys can just immediately start getting working on getting it done correctly? It would be having it. somebody here that's full time, mm -hmm. I mean, as Mr. Walt or somebody. Yeah. You know, I have a business to run. I yeah. can't be here. And it was Thursday. Luckily, yeah. I was off that right. day, and I was here all day. But if it's another, if it's a day in the summer and I'm busy, I'm not coming down. I just can't. I, yeah. I can't. You know, so, what was the history, Fred, behind that? Is it was, uh, two of the board members from a prior board complained that I was allowing Channel 22 to purchase replacements when they needed them okay. without the board's specific permission, and they then voted to. In fact, remove my permission to do anything with Channel 22. Okay. So. I don't think it's a problem, though. Ordinarily, I mean, ordinarily, it, has, it doesn't happen. Yeah. But I mean, the only the only problem is, Mr. Chairman, it's a problem now. That's right. We're in yeah. we're in we're in we're in a, a week where if something. I know, could but have, I don't think that that's to his not being able to do something it. wouldn't have solved changed wouldn't anything. Wouldn't have solved it. Would've, 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 it wouldn't have changed anything. No. Nope, well, no. he got it on no, quick. As soon as we were notified, I suggested. Yeah. Okay. So Brian goes out of his way. That's exactly my point. I know that. Yeah. I know that. And I'm just trying to make sure that yes. we, we have it. The next. TV comes in fabulous at my house. Yes. <laughs> but no, I just want to make sure that we're well, able to do things TV. quickly and efficiently. I never want to. For you. Right, right. And, uh, I, I think if Brian, from what I've seen for the last 12 years that I've been here, uh, if Brian needs something, he comes and asks for it, and the board always reacts yeah. positively. Right. This Echo. back then, we had a couple of disgruntled selectmen that aren't here anymore. <laughs> Blown. I don't know. Whatever. Most of them are. I, I totally agree with you. And it wouldn't have. And because it was when it was and Brian was here, he was able to do it. Right. He also overstepped his bounds by sending it out, costing a little more. Mm -hmm. We should have somebody here yeah. that is able to do that. And I, I would suggest that we put that policy back into effect to allow the town manager for an emergency. For, on emergencies to be able to expend the funds. And then bring it to the board. I'll second you. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yes. I'd make a motion that we do that. All right. Then I'll second, second you. Whatever. <laughs> so. I'll second one of you. All right. And is that something that you think is going to help? I think it would definitely help me. Yeah. Okay. Great. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thanks, Brian. You do a great job. Don't worry about if we miss a meeting. <laughs> I'm sure that people can go to the movies or something if yeah. they have nothing else to do. <laughs> but we really appreciate all the work you do. Everything you guys do, you do a great job. Yeah. 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 Moving on to the um, annual authorization to approve the agreement for auditing services. Mm -hmm. You have a motion Mr. For Welch. Mr. Chairman, uh, we uh, the auditors are about to start. We have awarded this bid, mm -hmm. and we are required to send uh, them a confirmation that they can stop the work. Mm -hmm. Do you have a motion framed? To uh, I just think to, to move to approve the agreement for auditing services by the consensus for, for the 2015 audit. calendar year. That's correct. Yes, also move. Second. All those in favor, unanimous. We have discussion of ratification of tentative CBAs. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. <coughs> well, before you tonight to um, go over the other um, collective bargaining agreements, um, just for the public certification, if they should ever get to see this, um, we were at the board's direction, the negotiating committee uh, was able to reach tentative agreements uh, with the remaining. Um, police and fire units. Um, I'll start off with the police unit, um, consistent with what we discussed previously with the Teamsters. Um, we were able to come to agreement with the uh, police, both patrolmen and sergeants uh, contracts. Um, and in general, the cost items I'll go through, um, are the number of sections there are, overall what I'll say is our, our goal was to go in and deal with the Cadillac tax issue. Um, we again with uh, both police, uh, patrolmen and sergeants, we're able to come to agreement on that major issue. In doing so, there are a number of agreements we made. Some of the items, as we've gone through them quickly, as we go through them quickly, are non-cost items that are language repairs or other items. So I'll go through them. Um, Article 11, uh, Section 4, and, and, and again, I'm doing a summary sheet that will both, the articles are somewhat different in each contract, but they, uh, pardon me, the numberings are different in each contract, but the item is relatively the same. Um, there's an agreement uh, that will allow 
our detectives and prosecutors during their um, lunch break to work out in the fitness room that's downstairs. That's a non-cost item. Um, in the, the sergeant's contract, um, there'll be a seniority change. Um, there was an agreement that takes our retired officers who remain as part-time officers will head the seniority list of the part-time folks. What that basically is doing is saying um, that the full-time service years are recognized for the full-time versus the summers that the part-timers do. Again, that doesn't really change anything. Those folks are already on the call list. There's no cost to that issue. Um, next item is um, uh, just a fixing a, a language issue that had to be left over on how the call list is called. Um, no issues there except for cleaning up some language. Um, the new ad is a comp time, for lack of a better term, bank. But an agreement that will allow um, officers to make a selection to choose rather than take overtime for work to take um, comp time earned at the same pace for up to no more than 40 hours is the maximum amount to be able to be accrued and it must be used within six months. Um, next is uh, for special officers who have served five or more years is an agreement to allow them to earn um, one personal day during the summer period. Um, again, it was a focus on really those longer serving folks um, to allow them some time off if need be. Um, there's a requirement that they have to have worked uh, at least 40 shifts in the year before in order for that provision to enact. And again, it's those that are five years of service or more. And as you'll recall, uh, with our thinning of the specials, there aren't all that many that are left in that ballpark. Um, as um, we had had a tentative agreement previously on dealing with the sick banks, some issues within the contracts that uh, the police units and the fire units have, there's some language that we have changed in there. Um, that we believe removes some old things and clarify some other issues that had led to grievances in the past. There was agreement there. Um, we fixed some language in several other areas that just fixes uh, an improperly listed RSA, um, as we did with the Teamsters, and again, as a part of the agreement now into the healthcare area, we reached agreement so that, that essentially any um, member of the association who, if the Cadillac tax should, if and when the Cadillac tax should take effect, those people will either move to a plan that does not hit the threshold limits or they will be responsible for paying 100% of the tax, thus protecting the taxpayers from any impact of that Cadillac tax, which again was the board's direction to us as our primary focus uh, during these negotiations. One of the other items we did in there is also increase the level for incentives for folks to opt out of our program uh, and increased from what is now Five hundred, seven hundred and fifty, and a thousand dollars for the single double family, to two thousand, three thousand, four thousand. On the top end, some of those plans are twenty-nine or in that ballpark, high twenty thousand. So it's an incentive for those folks to move off if they have an option. Um, we added some language in there also that those folks have to um, show us that in fact they are moving, they are covered under another plan in order for that to occur. Um, again, we touched on what the agreement is with regard to the Cadillac tax. Um, in a uniform allowance, there was a slight adjustment upward for detectives um, and only detectives who are required to wear both plain clothes and uniforms at a certain level. So there was an additional, I think it was $250 on the uniform allowance to help offset those costs associated with the detectives for that. Um, some other language cleaned up in another paragraph under Article 23. And finally, it's a three-year agreement, and it is at a 3% for each of those three years, three, three, and three over the three-year period. Essentially, that's a quick overview of all the items within the police contract. It's my suggestion that the board uh, make a determination of whether you want to move this forward first to ratify, and then second, move it forward to a warrant article. And I'd ask the board to take a vote on each of those. And that's already been ratified. Correct. All of these tentative agreements by the uh, groups have already been ratified by the respective groups. Okay. So would ask that there be a motion and the board's vote or on all of them or well we'll start with the police and then we'll go to the fire next and take them just so we're clear could uh, the assistant town manager and negotiator frame the motion and then we move and second it sure I'd be happy to answer any questions but I would first indicate that the board make a motion um, to ratify the contract and take a vote on that ratify the police patrolman and sergeant's contract as presented so moved second all those in favor, unanimous. You know, just a question, just to, on, on Article 20, 
or Article 19, Section 3 there, on the increasing the, the buyout. Mm -hmm. You know, just make sure that the public knows that that's a savings for us in the end. I mean, because you're giving them more money, but they're opting out of a very expensive. That's true. If additional folks opt off that plan, there's a substantial savings to the town. Um, on that. <coughs> Even as it is, there is a savings on the town for folks not being on right. that plan. But it's just more incentive to opt out, right? That, well, it's absolutely. It's yeah. recognizing the cost of that plan, and if folks move off, it certainly is a substantial savings to the town. Okay. Thank okay. You. And the second motion is the board, and you have the samples from, from earlier of the war draft warrant article, and ask that you'd move that forward as well. We have a draft warrant article for, you mean for the police yes, contract? Yes, ma'am. Police contracts. Contract. Both there's Plural. two warrant yes. articles. There's one for patrolmen and right. one for sergeants. That'll allow us to move that on to the budget committee also and present to them this week. That we see that those uh, ratified articles are added onto the warrant. I'll second it. All those in favor, unanimous. And now um, <clears throat> on the fire units, and again, there are two units. There are the firefighters and there are the uh, supervisors. Yeah. It's uh, local uh, 2664 and 3017. Yeah. Um, and again, um, based on your direction, we were unable to come to an agreement on the Cadillac tax language with these <coughs> units after numerous negotiations. Um, and at the board's direction, uh, before we uh, went to, to final impasse, uh, was decided to go back and talk to them about a one-year contract extension. Um, we were able to achieve that tentative agreement for each of those separate units at a 1.75% uh, increase, uh, as well as include a language dealing with the sick bank, solving those issues as we did in the police. There was previously this year the board had signed a memorandum of understanding with Local 2664 on that issue. We would incorporate that both into Local 2664 and 3017s. So again, it's a very simple 1.75, one-year duration, and the language with regard to the sick bank in both those two units. And both, yeah, contract, any questions. both contract proposals have been ratified by the unions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So move to uh, ratify the agreement and to uh, uh, post this a uh, warrant article. I'll second it. All those in favor, unanimous. And that is all and I have will, for you this evening. I will move that we see that both articles for the firefighters and supervisors unions be transferred on to warrant articles for the warrant. All those in favor, unanimous. Rusty Very seconded well. me. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Jamie. Nice job, Mark. Closing comments or other or other new business. Anybody? No. No. Closing comments. No. Twenty fifty two. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, unanimous. Uh, speedy.